Welcome back to Coursera. This is lecture 14. Now that we've talked about the musculoskeletal anatomy of several joints in the upper limb, we've now moved past the wrist into a really important anatomic region because what we're going to talk about are the muscles that act on the fingers and thumb that we use in everyday life, for example, to make a fist by flexing our fingers and thumb and returning our fingers and thumb to the anatomic position by extending them. So first off, we need to identify the joints at which muscles are acting and the actions possible at joints between the finger and thumb. First off, let's put some nomenclature in. The thumb is certainly the most lateral of our five digits, and as such, it's always referred to as digit number one. The index finger is digit number two. The middle finger is digit number three the ring finger, digit four, and the pinky will be digit number five. But certainly we refer to digit one as the thumb and the remaining four digits basically as being fingers. Note that at the base of each of the five digits embedded in the palm of the hand is a metacarpal. And the metacarpal basically is articulating in each of the five digits with the base of a proximal phalanx. There's a proximal phalanx in the thumb, and obviously we have four of them in the proximal parts of each finger. But note the difference. Note that each finger has two additional phalanges, a middle one and a distal one, whereas the thumb only has a single second phalanx. So, these joints that are formed between the phalanges and between the heads of each metacarpal are the major joints at which muscles act to flex and extend and move the thumb and the fingers by performing different actions. Note, however, that the thumb also has a very important carpo-metacarpal joint that is a much more active synovial joint than are the joints between the distal carpal rows and the metacarpals of any of the four fingers. And this carpal metacarpal joint is formed between the trapezium and the base of the first metacarpal, giving the thumb great additional mobility. All right, so let's look at the joints formed, number one, at what we call the knuckles. These are the knuckle joints. But being anatomically correct, the four knuckle joints are known as the metacarpophalangeal joints. And as we indicate on the slide, these are biaxial or condyloid joints. Because we'll see this pictorially, we can perform movements of these joints in two planes. Not only in the sagittal plane, where we flex and extend the thumb and fingers at these joints, but also basically at the this joint also permits, as we will see, ab and adduction when giving us the, the ability to finger spread. Then, once we move out more distally in the fingers, we have a pair of what are called interphalangeal joints. A proximal interphalangeal joint, or what we always call the PIP joints, and the distal interphalangeal joints, or the DIP joints. Note that, as we will see, these are all pure hinge joints, as is the joint that is formed between the two phalanges that make up the thumb. And by hinge joints, they are expected to produce only actions in the sagittal plane. But what we're going to see is the thumb moves in a very different series of planes than the fingers do. But we'll investigate that going forward. So activity. First off, let's look at the knuckle joints. So anatomically, the knuckle joints formed at the base of each finger between a metacarpal bone that is embedded in the palm of the hand and the proximal phalanx in each finger. These are where we not only have the ability to flex and extend the fingers at those joints, we also have the ability to finger spread by moving our fingers in the coronal plane perpendicular to the sagittal plane at which flexion and extension is taking place. And as, as we will see, we define finger spread 
by our ability to move our fingers in the coronal plane away from a defined axis that's passing through the middle of the middle finger. And we defined adduction, or bringing our fingers back to the anatomic position, as moving the fingers toward that same anatomic atlas that's passing through the middle of the middle finger. So you can out there basically finger spread, and you also have the ability to move your thumb in and out as well, but we'll talk about the planes of action that that occurs in a subsequent lecture. So then once we move distally, the hinge joints formed proximally and distally in each finger are pure hinge joints where we only permit flexion and extension of the fingers at those joints. So collectively, when we are making a fist using our fingers, we are flexing fingers at three different joints. We are flexing the fingers at the metacarpophalangeal joints, the proximal interphalangeal, and the distal interphalangeal joints. Basically, muscles that are performing those actions allow us to roll our fingers up and make a fist. And then, as we'll see, we also have the capability of rolling our finger over the flexed fingers to strengthen what we call our power grip. Now, muscles that are acting to flex and extend the fingers, for the most part, are found in the anterior and posterior parts of the forearm and must cross the wrist to reach, obviously, and act at these various joints extending or flexing them. But what we're also going to see is that muscles that are intrinsic to the hand will be the muscles which will give us the ability to finger spread. And by intrinsic, we mean that the muscles start and end in the hand largely by arising from the metacarpals. And these interesting little muscles are known, going to be called interosseous muscles. The term interosseous refers to the fact that these muscles, which give, you, give us the ability to ab and adduct at our metacarpophalangeal joints, or finger spread, are embedded or found between the metacarpal bones, as we will see in the palm of the hand. All right, so the other interesting point is that, as we said, since the major muscles, which are acting to flex particularly the joints that allow us to make a fist, flexing the metacarpal and proximal and distal interphalangeal joints of each finger, those muscles, since they arise in the flexor forearm, must cross the anterior aspect of the wrist to reach their distally acting joints. And the two major muscles which are going to flex our fingers at various joints will be a flexor digitorum superficialis and a flexor digitorum profundus. The word profundus meaning deep, superficial meaning, as it says it does, superficial. So the eight tendons of these muscles, four tendons for each, there they are, must cross the wrist on their way to act by flexing at the metacarpal and interphalangeal joints. And the way that these muscles cross the wrist is through a space that we identified very early on called the carpal tunnel, carpal tunnel. Note that these eight tendons of these two muscles are accompanied through the carpal tunnel by a tendon of the flexor pollicis longus that also traverses the carpal tunnel on its way into the hand of the wrist. So these tendons, to prevent them from what is called bowstringing when we flex our hand at the wrist, are kind of covered over by what is called a transverse carpal ligament or a flexor retinaculum. But as you'll hear from Dr. Macnow, the most important structure that is also traversing the carpal tunnel clinically is the median nerve. And you can see the median nerve coursing through the carpal tunnel just in back of or posterior to the flexor retinaculum and really just in front of or anterior to the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis. Then also heading in to the hand because it's going to be the major innervator of most of our intrinsic hand muscles will be the ulnar nerve. 
but the ulnar nerve is also crossing the medial aspect of the wrist, but it does not have to traverse the carpal tunnel. And everyone knows someone out there who's had carpal tunnel syndrome, and Dr. Macnow is going to talk about the clinical manifestations of that, that are largely the result of compression of the median nerve as it traverses this anatomic region of the upper limb. All right, so let's look at a list of the players. Again, as we've indicated, we're talking about movements of the fingers, and certainly one of the major ways we think of moving the fingers is to flex and extend them. So as we've already indicated, the two powerful flexors of fingers at various joints will be the flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor digitorum superficialis. And we'll identify pictorially what joints they actually act on to flex various joints, basically, of each finger. So these are what we call extrinsic muscles because their fleshy bellies are in the flexor forearm. And as we said, the tendons of each of these muscles, four from each, must pass through the carpal tunnel to reach, obviously, joints distal to the carpal tunnel at which they are acting. Note also that we have a series of intrinsic muscles that also act to flex and extend the fingers at certain joints. And some very important muscles that are performing a flexion, particularly at the proximal interphalangeal joint and the metacarpophalangeal joints, will be muscles known as lumbricals. So they, again, like the interosseous muscles, are going to be intrinsic muscles that start and end, basically, within the confines of the hand. So then on the extensor side, the most powerful extensor of the fingers will be so, a muscle somewhat logically named. It's called the extensor digitorum. But unlike its flexor partners, the extensor digitorum will only be a powerful extensor of the knuckle joints. We're going to need some additional muscles called the lumbricals, which will be the major extensors of the interphalangeal joints. Whereas on the flexor side, these two muscles not only have the capability of flexing at the knuckle joints, depending on the muscle, they will act at the proximal and or distal interphalangeal joints, whereas the extensor digitorum, interestingly enough, will not. Then, as we will see when we look at the intrinsic muscles of the hand, the interosseous muscles come in two groups. There is a group of dorsal interosseous muscle, which will allow us to finger spread by abducting our fingers at the MP joints, and a series of palmar interosseae that perform the antagonistic actions by bringing our fingers back to the anatomic position by moving them toward the defined axis that extends through the middle finger. So let's look at first the location of the extrinsic muscles that must pass through the carpal tunnel in order to flex various joints of the fingers. So note as we've already indicated that the anterior forearm contains four superficial muscles. Two of them we identified it earlier as muscles that act to flex the hand at the wrist. And we talked about the palmaris longus as performing nothing well, as well as the pronator teres. So these four muscles all arise with an attachment to the medial epicondyle of the humerus and cross and act at the elbow joint and or the proximal radial ulnar joint in the case of the pronator teres. But certainly these muscles' major action is going to be distally by either flexing the hand at the wrist for our carpal flexors or forming the palmaris longus. So the first of our prominent finger flexors is what we call an intermediate muscle in the flexor forearm. This muscle has not only an attachment to the medial epicondyle, but has a broad attachment basically to the shaft of the radius as well. And here is the location of where the four tendons of this flexor digitorum superficialis muscle must cross the anterior aspect of the wrist and by doing so pass through the carpal tunnel. 
Note that the flexor digitorum superficialis tendons will flex or act at any joint that they cross. So they will act as, obviously, flexors of the hand at the wrist. And since they also cross the knuckle joints, they are flexing the fingers at the metacarpophalangeal joints. But in a major way, we kind of define muscles as having a definitive or most important action based on the most distal joint that they cross. And the most distal joint crossed by the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis is the joint that is formed between the proximal and the middle phalanx. So the major action of this muscle, since their most distal attachment is to the base of the middle phalanx, is to flex basically the fingers, not only at the knuckle joints, but at the proximal interphalangeal joints that are shown at the tip of the arrow. Note that this muscle, by virtue of the fact that its tendons do not cross the distal interphalangeal joint, cannot act there. So we say that this muscle's major action, obviously, will be to all of the joints that it crosses, but the major action will be the most distal joint of the crosses. So we say that the major action of FDS is to flex the middle phalanx of the four fingers at the proximal interphalangeal joint. Then, its partner on the flexor side will be the flexor digitorum profundus. Four tendons of this muscle also pass through the carpal tunnel, but note that this muscle goes all the way to attach to the distal phalanx. So it's flexing any joints that it crosses, but we say that the major action of the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus is to flex basically the distal interphalangeal joints of each finger. And obviously you can see the tendons crossing not only that most distal joint, but certainly acting to flex at any other of the joints that it crosses, flexing the hand at the wrist and flexing at the knuckle or the proximal interphalangeal joints as well, certainly helping other muscles form a fist. Then on the extensor side, we've already indicated that the extensor digitorum is a muscle that you would think would be a powerful extensor working in the same way. But the extensor digitorum is kind of a misnomer in a way because the major attachment site of its tendon is really only to the bases of the proximal phalanx. That's the major attachment of its tendon. It does send slips that do attach to the base of the middle phalanx and the base of the distal phalanx, but this muscle is not powerful enough to extend the fingers at the interphalangeal joints. So we say that its major action is going to only extend the fingers at the metacarpophalangeal or the knuckle joints. And when we revisit them again, we're going to see, as we indicated on that chart, that intrinsic hand muscles called the lumbricals will actually be the more powerful muscles which will extend the fingers at the interphalangeal joints. Now let's consult our digital atlas again to see the action of our two extrinsic muscles which are passing their tendons through the carpal tunnel to act to flex at various joints of the fingers. First, we can see by highlighting here the location of the flexor digitorum superficialis, <clears throat> whose tendons pass through the carpal tunnel, as you see here, and move out, cross the knuckle joints and flex there, but move out to the bases of the middle phalanx, where their major action will be at the proximal interphalangeal joint. Then on a deeper plane, you can just barely see it here, I've highlighted the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus. And as you can see, these tendons also pass through the carpal tunnel and course all the way out to attach to the bases of the distal phalanges of all four fingers and act mainly to flex the distal interphalangeal joints. Now let's also consult our digital atlas by identifying 
the muscle belly of the extensor digitorum. So we indicated that this muscle was a misnomer because its tendons certainly crossed the extensor side of the wrist. And even though it has tendinous attachments to the bases of the proximal, middle, and distal phalanges, as you see here, the major action of this muscle is really limited to extending the fingers at the metacarpal phalangeal or the knuckle joints, despite the fact that you see all four fingers being extended by the contractions of this muscle in this picture. But as we will see in our next lecture, it's really the role of some intrinsic hand muscles called the lumbricals that play the important role in actually grabbing onto the extensor digitorum tendons and extending at the interphalangeal joints, both proximally and distally, of all four fingers.